Welcome to the chapel of Robinson College here at the University of Cambridge. It's 2020, it's lockdown and it's empty. So this term we're conducting a series of interviews with key thinkers from around the world. And our theme is the fall of Jerusalem's great temple in the 70th year of the first century. The temple had been a place that consciously barred access to disabled Israelites. But when Jesus entered the temple, he welcomed them. And today we reflect on what that welcome might entail in the 21st century. To explore this challenge, we're delighted today to welcome Dr. Brian Sloan, a fellow here at Robinson, and Professor Brian Brock, whose recent book, Wondrously Wounded, exposes how our modern world is structured in such a way that access to full humanity is denied to those we describe as disabled. Interweaving his penetrating analysis with an account of how his family had both cared for and learned from their son Adam, Brian Brock's book offers far more than a helpful theoretical perspective. This is a work that leaves the reader questioning altogether our modern assumptions about what it means to be human. Professor Brian Brock is a theological ethicist, holds a personal chair at the University of Aberdeen, and is author of multiple works on disability and theology. We begin our conversation with a reading from scripture that highlights how one leader in the early church sought to draw alongside and to listen well to those who might be considered to be on the fringes of society. Then the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Start out and go south to the road that leads down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. He set out and was on his way when he caught sight of an Ethiopian. This man was a eunuch, a high official of the Kandake or Queen of Ethiopia, in charge of all her treasure. He had been to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage and was now returning home sitting in his carriage and reading aloud from the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go and meet the carriage. When Philip ran up, he heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I without someone to guide me? And invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. The passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb that is dumb before the shearer. He does not open his mouth. He has been humiliated and has no redress. Who will be able to speak of his posterity? For he is cut off from the world of the living. Please tell me, said the eunuch to Philip, who it is that the prophet is speaking about here, himself or someone else. Then Philip began, and starting from this passage, he told him the good news of Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. Look, said the eunuch, here is water. What is to prevent my being baptised? And he ordered the carriage to stop. Then they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. When they came up from the water, the spirit snatched Philip away. The eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. I'd probably say first of all Brian this is Brian and Brian Brian yes hello um, <laughs> hi Brian nice to meet you you too Professor Brian Brock a very warm welcome to this digital version of Robinson College Chapel and Dr Brian Sloan um, welcome 
to the same thing. I don't think you've participated in one of the digital versions yet. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Brock, who in his most recent book has raised questions related to what we call disability that enforce us to think differently and for Christians to read the Bible differently. And I wonder, could you begin by saying something about what compelled you to write that book in the first place? Thank you, Simon. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to talking to uh, Dr. Sloan as well. Um, I started out in medical ethics um, many years ago, and uh, I took a sort of long journey through different fields. And I was never really entirely comfortable about medical ethics uh, because it seemed to be designed to fix problems of doctors and um, disability is one of the things that fits very awkwardly with that way of thinking about ethics. So I kind of set the field aside, um, but had been made aware that uh, disability was, a, was an interesting theme. Uh, and then uh, right as I was finishing up my um, doctorate, my wife Stephanie and I had our first child, which was, uh, who's named Adam, who's now uh, 16. And um, that forced me, uh, who has um, Down syndrome and autism, and that forced me to really start to think about disability in a much more concerted way um, and sort of swing back around to ask questions, not only about medical ethics um, and about the medical domain, but about society in general. And um, so I'm in Aberdeen, which is a kind of specializes in theology and disability. And um, I've finally drawn together a range of thoughts that I've sort of built up over 15 years or 20 years thinking about disability in, in a theological light. It's a very narrative based book, as well as being a heavyweight um, academic piece. And I, by heavyweight, I mean, forces you to think seriously, um, but interwoven with personal narrative, as is the more popular book that you've published recently um, and I think it's it's it has the capacity to reposition the reader entirely so there are lots of dimensions to it that uh, have forced me to reconsider my reading of scripture so for instance I've been studying Luke's gospel for decades and I feel I have to revisit my entire interpretation of that book based on what I thought was a very specialist topic um, and one of the things that really undermined my assumption was the question of indiscriminate healing when Jesus wanders around. It's as if there weren't enough Brian's here already. I can't help but think of the life of Brian, where there's a character shouting arms for an ex-leper um, and complaining that Jesus, while he's minding his own business, Jesus walks by and without so much as a by your leave, heals him and robs him of his livelihood as a beggar. And it really plays into this idea that we assume Jesus just randomly blanket bombs people he meets with healing. And I think one of the things that your book forced me to do is to revisit the question more specifically about what's happening when Jesus is healing somebody. And I wonder if you could say something about that, about how this is something that you what alerted you to that? Yeah, that, uh, well, I'm, I'm really glad that we have uh, uh, Dr. Sloan here because um, my experience of talking to people um, who have uh, either conditions that we call disabilities from birth or uh, have acquired them and they're not going away, find um, Christians often to be quite, quite awkward. Um, because Christians always think that they want to be different than they are. They want to be healed. Um, now that might be true in some cases, but in other cases, um, classically people who, for instance, are, are deaf, um, they may have never been able to hear and their whole self understanding and cultural uh, uh, universe that they live in is built around uh, being deaf is just a, a regular part of life. Um, and I began to see that, uh, um, well, I'm, as you can tell, I'm, I'm bald. Um, and if everybody thought, oh, it's the end of the world to be bald, obviously some people do think that. But I don't really think that. I've kind of come to terms with it. If people were always assuming uh, that um, that needed to be changed, that would 
sort of wear on you. And, um, and, and the more I talk to people with disabilities, especially um, ones that they come to terms with, the more I realize the offensiveness, Ty Agnes, of uh, Christian assumptions about what healing and redemption actually boils down to. And so um, in the, this popular book, which isn't uh, quite out yet, it'll be coming in a pastoral series, I focused on um, Peter and John in Acts 3, healing um, the man who it said uh, is crippled, was crippled from birth. Um, and uh, there's also hints in some of the other connections that he's, he's 40 years old. So it's, he's almost certainly been there um, during the time when Jesus was there and Jesus was there living. He, he was teaching daily in the temple. It's, it's regularly emphasized. That's what eventually gets him crucified because he makes the, the temple officials so, so angry um, that they can't sort of shut him down. So he's teaching and he's healing people. So it, it's pretty certain historically that Jesus actually walked by this man um, and without healing him and without being asked to be healed, even though everybody knew, right? There's a, there's a, a kind of social space that's been opened up. These, this odd teacher, uh, offensive teacher who's been here for day in and day out, um, sleeping over on the, on the Mount of Olives and um, uh, has this group of people around him and he's, he's teaching and healing and, uh, you know, he's, he's really, stirring things up so everyone knew what was going on and yet there's this beggar who is not interested in being healed so i use that as a example of how the church uh gets it wrong because uh the way the story is told uh peter and john peter walks up and says um look at me and then he says i don't have money to give you but i'll give you what i have and he sort of takes his hand and lifts him up expecting him to be healed. And we don't, I mean, we can imagine what's going on there. It could be that he was just frustrated that this guy hadn't believed and he wanted him to believe. It could be that he was thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to, in an act of despair, I'm going to try to heal this guy. And if he's not healed, I'm just going to give it up entirely. Um, uh, it, it could be that he, uh, as he is portrayed, earlier in the story just is impulsive and he decided to do it. But um, all of those things are um, features of the way Christians have responded to uh, people with disabilities in churches in, in the modern era. And I thought it was a useful way to think through um, the difference between Jesus and the church. Um, uh, and I, I, I make the argument in the, in the book that Jesus never heals anyone who doesn't ask for it. We have to sort of nuance that around, um, uh, like the Gerizim demoniac who, who clearly is, uh, uh, not in possession of himself. Um, but what, what is evident is that Jesus is not, um, uh, the WHO going in to sort of clear out a whole country of, of illness and, and disability. And, um, and so Peter's, uh, taking it, proceeding in a different way toward this man um, is a way for us to think about how, as Christians, can we um, both hope for healing and um, appreciate the predicament of people who are socially marginalized, but also that we get it wrong and for that not to paralyze us. So that um, I think one of the, the sort of presenting issue that made me want to meditate on this story was people with disabilities feeling being ambushed healed in various ways when they come to church. And the, the other side of that is Christians um, uh, being immobilized, uh, uh, having the hesitation blues every time somebody with a disability comes into a church, visible disability, because they don't know what to do. And then of course we all feel that the kind of the oddity of somebody not really fitting in is displayed in body language. So that's the Peter story is just a way to say, um, we're talking about a, an awkward moment in the story of God with the world. And um, uh, this, the, the man does get healed and he does, as the story unfolds, uh, he is grateful for that. Um, but that's not the only story we have in scripture. And I wanted to sort of highlight, there's some 
pretty surprising twists in the story if we read it with a disability lens in view. One of the great phrases that you've used once or twice, uh, I think in the book that's about to come out is the notion of a drive-by healing, which seems to capture, I guess, what Peter was doing, but that had never occurred, the idea that Jesus had probably walked past this chap throughout his visits to Jerusalem and not done anything about it. Well, I mean, one thing to say for me is that I'm sometimes stopped on the street by preachers who are pretty certain that if they say the right things and lay their hands on me in the right way, that I will be healed. And that, that kind of rhetoric is something that some Christians still still use even on the street, not physically necessarily even in the church. So it kind of resonates, I think, with that, that there's an assumption that you want the healing, but also an assumption that they've got some kind of direct line to God, um, which I suppose in modern times we would have certain problems with believing in a sense. But the other thing that struck me in terms of the conversation so far is the idea that within work on care that I would be looking at and uh, work on disability studies, there is a certain contest about the notion of vulnerability and whether that's an appropriate way to describe people. But there's also the idea that actually, you know, everyone is vulnerable to a greater or lesser extent. And so none of us is perfect. And we all require adaptations to be able to enter a building. You know, but for some people, a staircase will do, for example, whereas for others, they need something else. But there's this general sense that it's wrong to categorize people in particular ways, when actually all we've done is to make it seem as though certain people need a particular kind of help, which paints this picture of the autonomous human being as you know, one side of the story and the completely helpless person on the other side. And the reality is that we all require each other, we're all dependent in some particular way on other people, albeit that sense of dependence or vulnerability might be greater for some people than for others. And that was a theme that I think did resonate through the book um, that I read, although I don't know to what extent you were kind of going for that, but I'm conscious that from my particular perspectives, I perhaps tore out different and, and brought out different themes than what you were expecting at times. Yeah, I think that's, those are, those are really important themes. Uh, one of the um, core texts in the development of disability theology is uh, uh, Alistair McIntyre's book, uh, Dependent Rational Animals. Um, and he, uh, pointed out what I would summarize as the tendency to work in a best case scenario uh, anthropology. So, I mean, we could, we can turn the case you've made around and say, if um, stairs were four feet tall, almost no one would be able to get up them and it would disable a lot of people. Uh, so if we sort of think in a, in a gradient, um, stairs are, let's say four inches high, because statistically, most people are going to find that uh, the most useful height, um, or at least most people in the prime of their health. And what you know, disability activists have pointed rightly pointed out is that um, if you put in ramps, for instance, there are a lot of people that end up using them. People with prams, uh, people who are aging, and on unsteady on their feet. And um, so that uh, it highlights how our assumptions and our built environment start with the idea of uh, classically the kind of white male at the height of his powers. And um, uh, everybody else is somehow slipping 
further away from that ideal. Um, uh, and to speak about dependency and vulnerability is already to point out that every one of us is very vulnerable and dependent at the beginning and end of our life. But um, uh, as I sort of draw out in, in, my, in the popular book, any one of us by injury can be, uh, have our capacities radically altered immediately. Um, and that if we make it impossible for human beings who don't have the full complement that statistically is average, um, we create a quite inhumane society. So can I push you a little further along this avenue? I mean, it seems that one of the things that wondrously wounded does is hold a, a mirror up to everyone. This is, this is not just a book about disability. It's a book that almost redefines what it is to be human or to be abled. You know, if you're raising questions about disability, of course, raises the question about ability. And I wonder if you might say a little more about what constitutes an able person as conceived by scripture. Well, I mean, at the, at the root, the sort of your initial question about why did I write the book, um, for me, really comes back to um, if we're thinking about what it means to be a human being in such individualist and, and uh, functionalist terms, we're actually not understanding the gospel. We're not understanding how um, the kingdom of God is a, is a kind of interrelation, an interweaving of people. Um, if I can sort of tie some of these issues together uh, with one of the stories that I tell in the, in the popular book, um, uh, I talk about a discussion I had with um, uh, a woman named Chantel who's in a, uh, who has cerebral palsy and has been in a wheelchair her whole life. And we were talking about what she hoped for from the resurrection, um, which is a way of talking about redeemed life and how the body is going to look um, in, in the state of full redemption. And we were discussing one of her mentors is a woman named Johnny Erickson Tata, who's very you know globally well known, um, who uh, as a teenager had a broke her neck in an accident, and then she spent her life as a quadriplegic in a wheelchair as well. And Chantel and Johnny had different imagination or expectations about the re their resurrected body. And Chantel thought, "I'm going to be able to uh, have an incredible wheelchair." Uh, that's you know has jetpacks and can fly around and Johnny said I, I want to walk again but as this story unfolded it became clear that Chantel's real vision of what redemption consists in came when there was a, a church youth event that she had kind of offered not to go on because uh, they couldn't find a wheelchair accessible bus and um, the group said, we're not going to go without you and we're going to figure out a way to do this, uh, even if we have to sort of lift you onto the, the bus that we have. And it was at that moment that she could see that her kind of self-renunciation to not slow everybody else down uh, was, uh, uh, was giving up on the redemption on, on offer in the uh, Christ kingdom and the real redemption was, no, we, we want you to be with us and we're going to wait for you. Um, uh, we're going to figure out a way to do this. Uh, and so I think one of the central points that I'm making in both books in different ways is that we in the West, especially for, for historical reasons, have an imagination that's too ordered by creation, the physicality of the world. Um, uh, and Paul's in First Corinthians 15 is very um, outspoken that that's a that's a kind of foolish type of question to ask. We'll be we'll be resurrected in a different kind of body that has some continuity with this one. But the point is that we'll be resurrected into a life without estrangement and without there being center and margins, and that that is a way of talking about what already begins when church is being what church is supposed to be, which is a place without center and margins that doesn't overrule the fact that 
we're Jew and Greek. It recognizes those things, but it recognizes them in a very specific way uh, that's not um, uh, constructing hierarchies in which some people are the real human being and some people are the, the outriders, as the best case scenario anthropology has it. Brian Sloan. I'm conscious that we've spent, obviously, a lot of time so far talking about a Christian kind of standpoint, and that's understandable. And this is a chapel sermon series, so that's to be expected. But of course, many of the people watching this will not be Christians and may be atheists at all, uh, and may not believe in, in God at all. Um, and there is a sense in your book that the problem that you identify wondrously wounded is that we've lost a sense of wonder in God's creation to the point where all we can do is try to mitigate a sense of disappointment in parents with disabled children. That was one of the points you made. I wonder, you know, what is it that you might be able to say or that your work says to someone who doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in creation in that sense at all? We're after the Copernican turn um, uh, in which the ancient way of talking about the good life was to come uh, to come into alignment with the cosmos and its order and the polis and its order and that's how the flourishing life was achieved but with the realization that the, uh, um, uh, the heliocentric uh, universe was uh, no longer real is no longer true we're not the center of the universe the human is not the pinnacle of creation uh, modern humanity has to figure out how it's going to or organize itself order itself what's normative what its normative frameworks are going to be um, and one of the um, dilemmas of that situation is that all normative frames are purely horizontal so if we think about the um, in the ancient world, uh, the true and the good classically in platonic frameworks could come from outside. It could be uh, somehow uh, revealed to humans within their horizontal relationships and therefore give them a kind of normative orientation against the status quo of their interpersonal and even inter-material uh, relations. Um, and we see an echo of the, our of the loss of that vertical outside horizon for normative claims in even the language of marginalization that, you know, if you think about marginalization, it's a horizontal image that um, when people are marginalized, they're pushed to the outside. Uh, and so I think what I'd want to discuss with the non-believer is um, the very way in which the problem of including people that are marginalized is put together demands that there always be someone at the margins. Uh, because if, if we live in a purely social universe in which human beings have to decide what morality will be, um, uh, we can only embark on the attempt to, to bring in the people who've been marginalized and yet that's an infinitely receding uh, boundary. There will always be people who are marginalized. Uh, there will always be uh, um, types of, for instance, conceptions who are statistically less wanted or not, or lives at the end of uh, human existence, which people think are not worth living. Um, so I, I think that the dilemma of the Copernican moral universe is that the margins never can be caught. They always are there and they're always receding. And so that's why I'm asking, focusing my reflections on the redemption that is imagined and to a certain extent experienced in church. Uh, and my sort of question to non-believers were how, it would be, how do you conceive of real togetherness? Uh, togetherness which does not generate margins. I think that's an extremely difficult conceptual question that has direct moral implications because we're always thinking of 
inside groups and outside groups. And uh, in all those discussions, people with disabilities are prone to ending up in outside groupings. So the, the kind of disability is ultimately a problem of how we conceive the togetherness that, um, uh, that we're striving for. Can I steer you towards the final question on this topic then, from a Christian perspective, in the book about disability that's soon to come out, um, and linking um, disability again with the New Testament, you re return frequently to one of the stories in the book of Acts, where Philip is chasing alongside the chariot of uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Can you say about, A, about why you use that image so frequently, and B, what that might say to the secular world? Yeah, that, so the, I, I set up a contrast between um, Peter imperiously and un, really without asking, healing someone or sort of uh, inviting the healing of the, the, the sort of beggar at the temple gates. And one of, that's a story from Acts. And one of the stories of Acts is that uh, the place of worship is now sort of heading out into the world, um, uh, which is following the work of the Spirit. So that the story of um, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch is a story of the Spirit. It's very sort of, the Spirit tells Philip to go out on this road, and he's walking on the road, and he, um, a chariot, no doubt, impressive chariot comes by with an Ethiopian, and I, I, I think the imagination there is that he's, uh, uh, you've got very dark skin, uh, and as a eunuch, um, he's also visibly marked as having been castrated. He's a Gentile. He's from uh, a kind of sexual category and a racial category that people at the heart of the empire are not wanting to be, um, even though he's a powerful um, court official. And so he's uh, he's basically passing by on the, on the chariot reading from Isaiah and Philip hears him. And I think it's a delightful image because then he's, Philip is running alongside the chariot and they start a conversation and um, uh, uh, the eunuch asks him to come up and, and says, how can I understand if no one um, explains to me? Um, but what I think is, fascinating about the story is that yes the Ethiopian hears the gospel um, but our picture of the Christian there is not coming up and telling him I can fix you know that your marginalization that's not the offer the offer is um, uh, to explain the scriptures and that the Holy Spirit to make that happen has put Philip in a pretty um, uh, a position of following. Um, so he's, he's not only running, literally running after a, a chariot, he then has to get on. And so as he's explaining the scriptures, I think it's a useful way to think about the church having to see the world from uh, someone else's perspective. Um, uh, there are chariots that God rides on in Ezekiel, and I've, I've discussed those in this, in the popular book. Um, the idea of a a wheelchair is not something that existed in the ancient world, but that there was a kind of uh, imagination of a chariot as a, as a way to create mobility that Philip is joining into, and he's therefore starting to see the world uh, and scripture along with the Ethiopian from the perspective of um, the Ethiopian's vantage point. And I think that is something that the church today really needs to learn from disabled people, that we don't need to explain to disabled people why um, uh, their real selves is shorn of their disabilities. Uh, we need to sit down and learn from them how the world looks from their perspective. And when we do that, we'll not only see different things about scripture, we'll learn all sorts of things about what togetherness actually looks like. And that's the model of togetherness that you would offer to the secular world. Yes. Yeah. So that uh, 
the spirit is depicted in this passage as drawing Christians alongside people that they would typically find very different. Um, and in the course of that, uh, revealing to them that they're not different in substantive, politically potent ways, even if the differences that they would see on the surface still remain. Uh, and I think it's important in these kind of discussions not to go to the, we're all the same in God's eyes or we're all disabled. And even I, I would tend to resist the we're all vulnerable um, line because it um, uh, has the effect of downplaying the way that if you are spending your life in a wheelchair or if you're spending a, your life um, having trouble controlling your tongue, um, your, your education will be shaped by that. Your, your life chances will be shaped by that. Your employment possibilities will be shaped by that. And so we can't um, very easily pretend, um, oh, we, you know, I see past your disability or your race or your whatever marginalized, marginalized characterization. Um, uh, we need to, to, to learn what it means to actually be together. Uh, and that will include um, those who consider themselves fully able uh, uh, slowing down. I mean, the sort of contemporary language is sort of giving up power. Um, but uh, uh, all those debates which you guys are having in Cambridge in, in a in a pretty foregrounded way about race right now, um, it's it's never easy to give up uh, power. And I think if the discussion is always construed of those with privilege and who's uh, who who always end up getting the benefit of the doubt, they have to kind of be forced to uh, by those on the margins to give up some of their power. And I think that this image of um, Philip and the, and the Ethiopian is really useful because it's not a story of rival power. It's a story of people being drawn together by by uh, uh, the spirit, you know, an agency outside of them, which they both submit to and become different people and form a, a community that they had never imagined possible. One of the issues that I think for me pervaded the book was to do with best interests of a child relating to issues of capacity and also parental responsibility towards children with disabilities. And I suppose I would pick up on those themes because I teach family law. I also got the sense that you were perhaps a little uneasy about the extent to which you should be drawing the example of Adam from your own life in order to write the book. But in the end, you felt that you could rationalize it. I wonder if you could maybe just say a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, that's a really, that's quite a cutting edge um, set of themes that I'm wrestling with there. I mean, the basic, uh, background problem in disability studies um, is that is encapsulated by the slogan nothing about us without us so um, at one level I as a typical abled person um, uh, and part of a group who has very often spoken about people with disabilities as if we know um, you know, what their lives are like or what their experience is. Um, so I'm, that's, I have to explain why I have the right to enter this discussion at all. Um, uh, and the, the short answer to that is, well, can we really talk about my nonverbal sons, teenagers' life in, in abstraction from mine and more importantly, can I really, uh, as a father, speak about my life in abstraction from his, right? So that the individualism of many of the ways that we talk about disability is part of what I'm trying to press in talking about Adam. Um, 
by the way, uh, uh, we actually were in the period that I was sort of finalizing the book going through his guardianship application. Um, because I do know of a case firsthand where um, people who, for instance, live in communities um, are admitted to hospital and they have, uh, you know, uh, various um, learning difficulties and communication difficulties and eating uh, sort of habits that are non-standard. And so um, I know of one case specifically where uh, because the uh, hospital didn't trust the, the, the community in which he lived, they refused to let that community come in and they therefore put this man with Down syndrome. They just gave him his meals and for various complicated reasons, he didn't eat them and he starved to death in the hospital because um, the, the way the hospital care is put together is not prepared to take the time to figure out how to, to get him to eat. Um, so for us, it's quite existentially close topic. We need to, we need to have guardianship because we don't want that to happen to our son who's, uh, you know, just become an adult and yet has uh, almost no communicative capacity. Um, so we were going through that legal process at the time I was writing this book. And I, I, you'll, you'll be aware that the, it's a very odd thing to be given entire legal right over another human being. Um, so at one level, the state with some safeguards says, uh, you, you as a father can disenfranchise your child of all legal personhood almost. I mean, it's not fully personhood, but it's all rights, all bank, all rights to handle money, self-determination, um, uh, medical decisions. Um, so that there's a legal frame and discourse running that um, can uh, allow sweepingly um, broad latitude to uh, me speaking for him, while at the same time in the disability discourse is the opposite problem that um, people are immediately suspect for, for me to speak for him in any case. And so draw this long comment to a close. What I'm trying to do in Wondrously Wounded is point out that he is an agent in the same way that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are both agents, but they're agents caught up in something outside of them. And so there, I tell a few stories that try to highlight how I understand Adam as a baptized Christian to be a Christian like everyone else and to have his own witness like everyone else. And so I position the book as my witnessing to his witness, not speaking for him and not speaking on his behalf, but trying to tell the story of what I've seen happened through in and through him um, in the, the glorious story of, of God's uh, life with the world. I think from a reader's perspective, it very much leaves you with the uh, impression that your voice starts to fade, especially towards the end, to make room for Adam's voice to be heard. And it's a powerful voice. And I think it, for those of us who started the book thinking it was about disability, it shakes the ground, I think, under the feet of everyone. And it's a fantastic book. We're very grateful that you've come on to talk about it. Grateful for visiting digital Robinson College Chapel and thank you as well to Brian Sloan for helping with this interview. Professor Brian Brock, thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you.